Thank you. Welcome, everybody. I'm so excited to be here. It's bright and, well, not that early, in Calgary, Alberta, Canada. Um, if we could just start with everyone just uh, saying a bit about themselves, like where they're from. I know some people don't know each other. Many do. Just, you know, just a quick introduction so we can all get an idea of where we're coming in from today. And maybe, I don't know, what you're doing, like what your job or career is or what you're studying, anything like that. It's always interesting. Nine people are typing now. Eight people, nine, nine. That's awesome. So many people came in. I appreciate it. Librarians, excellent. Librarian. Oh, I didn't know that, Sarah. We need to connect. Student success and engagement, K 12s. Jess, yeah. Helen, Bath, UK. Librarian. Okay, so librarians, graduates, students, teachers, instructors, we're all over the place. From Uruguay. Ada, that's right. With Virginia, okay. <laughs> librarians. Okay, lots of librarians. So we're gonna start. Um, the way that I've set this up is um, Martin's gonna be looking at the chat, and if we want to stop and focus on something, I've made this very research focused because that's the intention of GoGN. Um, but there are other things that we can talk about as well. Okay. So first, I just want to start off with I acknowledge that I am on the Treaty 7 territory here in Calgary, Alberta. I acknowledge the past, present, and future generations of Stony Nakoda, Blackfoot, and Tutsina nations who helped me steward the land as well as honor and celebrate our place. Now, although this picture is uh, just actually down the road from me during the summer, this morning I was out shoveling my walk. Um, so it's still snowing here in Canada, but in Canada, I just want to acknowledge that um, the Indigenous people have had a huge influence in who we are. And as we will see a little bit about the direction of um, my open educational practices research. I created this um, PowerPoint to create kind of a networked <laughs> resume for lack of better uh, understanding. So this gives you an idea of the fact that I started out as a K-12 teacher, um, teaching grade four, social studies, grade eight, all the way up to grade 12. And then I started to expand into other areas. So the blue is strict K-12. The gray is um, networked open volunteer opportunities or uh, digital learning opportunities. So there's a lot of MOOCs in there. Um, there's facilitation of something called gamified ed, which was where we used Minecraft and learned about gamification around the world from an inter um, disciplinary and intergenerational between higher ed and K-12. And then you have um, more formal gr in green. So they're all how I kind of transformed into the instructional designer world. And the yellow represents more very formal education in terms of like my dissertation or going to um, UBC doing my master's and at Royal Roads. So I have two master's degrees. And then the red is kind of what we're where I'm at today, and that's my online teaching in particular. And today I am a sessional instructor at University of Calgary and University of Victoria, but I am going back to um, my school district next year and uh, teaching whatever they give me. Um, so I'm looking forward to that as well. But my point here is that in 2020, you can walk in both worlds. You can, you are multiple educational systems and networks and contexts. And the more you celebrate that, um, the more you can learn. So to my research, the problem, well, learning happens everywhere. And the K-12 students have the opportunity to access people, content and ideas that were previously inaccessible. However, there are real and preconceived barriers to accessing these digital networks outside of K-12 classroom walls. So I really wanted to think about 
the fact that not all teachers have experienced open learning. Um, they might be doing open learning. They might be using open educational resources. And I wanted to look at a way to examine how teachers in K-12 learning environments are looking for ideas of examples of expanding learning beyond classroom walls. But there wasn't really a framework. So when I started the research, I wanted to consider how the students can learn by increasing learner interactions, connections, and collaborations, specifically by expanding from formal into informal learning environments. But I didn't want to replicate, replicate the current models that I saw in networked learning contexts for a variety of reasons. Um, specifically, in K-12 learning contexts, we have learners under 18 years of age. But we also have learners at all stages of open readiness, and they're doing a lot of things in informal learning environments anyway. And I didn't know if I wanted to learn about everything that they were doing in informal learning environments. So how do you balance that? I considered real and perceived barriers, district policies, digital safety and privacy, digital literacies, learner mindset, student agency and voice, knowledge building and sharing, digital identity, how to connect, what to connect with, who to connect with. This is a kind of a summary of my lit review um, of current and foundational literature. Now, a lot of these people are in other, obviously, literature reviews and many of our literature reviews in GoGN, but you'll also see many people who aren't in the literature reviews. So if we look at some of the foundational theorists, we have Vygotsky, Dewey, Barth, Roland Barth, who doesn't come up a lot, but he was huge during the open education movement, specifically in the United States. And look at the timing as well on, on the dates on these. And also Scardamalia and Barreter, who talk about knowledge building. And knowledge building as a theory, I think, has huge potential in open learning and open education. Um, more of um, more recent people that we would all know. We have Kuros here, Kanoal, Henry Jenkins, Ito. Um, that's connected learning. And I don't hear a lot about connected learning. Sometimes I do, but not a lot. Um, Drexler talked about personal learning environments. Cronin, open readiness. Greenhow, which is social media space for learning. And how do K-12 learners learn in, with using or using and in, in integrating social media and network publics with Boyd? I'm looking at questions, so if anyone has any questions, you know, just ask away. Um, I had to start off by creating a contemporary construct of open educational practices in K-12 learning environments. And as has been discussed by numerous other um, colleagues and researchers, um, open educational practices are contextual and it had to be based on a high school learning context. So some of the things that did come up, though, from the beginning from the literature, when I compared and contrasted open learning, open pedagogy, open educational practices, open education, open educational resources, um, is that before we started, the context was that open educational pr practices integrate ideas from multiple perspectives of open and networked learning. It's an education without barriers, and those barriers were multiple and different depending on context. Learners can find, consider, and share knowledge with others. It is facilitated by a teacher, so that's important. It doesn't mean that it is not, um, students aren't just self-directed, but there is always a teacher in my context in some way, shape, or form. It extends and builds upon sociocultural and connectivist learning theories to bridge formal and informal learning spaces. It's safe in terms of data, privacy, and well-being. And the word safe means that the students will have an understanding. So they give their consent. They understand the data that they are sharing. Um, it does, and, and it also means that we talk about communication in online um, learning communities. So that's kind of what we meant by safe. Um, it's student-centered learning where individual learners and voices are respected in participatory learning culture, and it encourages collaboration and interaction between mentors and nodes of learning. So that was a context before we even started. And using that context, I created my original, um, what I called the oldie, the open learning design intervention. Um, ironically, 
the word old is in there, which I thought was interesting because nothing about this research really is that new. What That was a, a big awakening for me that this has already been done before. Many times, many people have talked about this all the way back through time in different ways. So it's just um, thinking about doing things in a different way, thinking as Freire talks about thinking about how we could be doing things differently so that it is student learning focused. So we start with the learner, which is you'd think obvious, but that's what we start with. The idea was we developed digital literacies um, and then we intentionally increased and encouraged interactions, collaborations and connections. And we connected those to the outcomes, objectives and competencies of our school curriculum. And that would encourage them to build their personal learning network. All the while, this little arrow on the top, which is cut off, is they'd be doing some reflection. Now, due to the webinars that I've been on, actually the GoGN, this is what the next slide, this is why I did the next slide. This is my conceptual framework. And I think a conceptual framework is so important to guide your research. Um, and I, I just remember Penny talking about it and Carolyn talking about it. So these were my research questions. What are students and teachers' perspectives of open learning experiences? And to what extent does OEP expand learning opportunities for high school learners? And how does an open learning design intervention support teachers in designing for learning? I used a design-based research approach, which we'll go into a little more detail in a minute, to create a framework that I had to design myself, which is called the Open Learning Design Intervention. And then I split it into the theoretical framework, and I split it into the more um, a conceptual framework. Just checking, love good conceptual diagram. <laughs> I have to admit there were books that Penny suggested. I've passed them on to many a Gojian colleague. Um, actually, I should remember those books because the conceptual framework helped, especially in my data analysis, it doesn't make any sense right now, I guess, as I'm saying it, but I finally realized that my the framework that I created, the oldie was really how I, I did everything, how my methodology was, it worked how I thought about my data analysis and, and we'll see it as we go on. So my research methodology was a design based research methodological approach. Um, so again, you'll see lots of visuals in this. I learned that I love creating and drawing visuals um, and I do them mostly in PowerPoint or in Google Docs, but the visuals really help me pull ideas together. So design-based research, the, the important part, the important things to know about it is it balances theory and practice. And as you can see in my conceptual framework, I tried to balance theory and practice, practice in terms of conceptual, um, the conceptual nature of my research as well. So that's great that the theory worked, but the practice and conceptual part also had to work at the same time. And so there's always that balance and checking in. Uh, Design-based research participants and researchers have a voice. It's a collaborative design intervention. It's in an authentic research learning environment. It has practical application and replication. And now it's just seen as iterative cycles and prototypes. So you start off in these phases. There's three phases of your research. Phase one is really the starting point. So you start with your lit review, your proposal, your ethics review. And then I had the opportunity and then as we'll discuss this more later, but I could try out my prototype. So I could try out the oldie um, in a project in a high school learning environment. And, and some um, of my peers at my university only really did one prototype, but I was able to try my prototype, which I call learning pathway one, and it completely bombed. So the great thing about design-based research is that I had the opportunity to try my prototype twice, as you could see, and make, make a lot of mistakes as a researcher, figure out a lot of things about myself, realize how much I had to work on relationships and with my uh, participants. And, and as a beginning researcher in your doctoral studies, you, you, uh, you're a beginner in many, many things. You have strong skill set in many aspects, but you're also a beginner in many aspects. So the opportunity to make these mistakes and learn through iterations like I did, so you can see phase one had 
all of those things going on, the literature review, the proposal, as well as two complete cycles of, of data collection and doing projects with students. And then for phase two, I ended up doing uh, two prototypes. And really, I could have stopped with Learning Pathway 3 um, because it answered my research questions and I got the data that I wanted. But I think this is where the open researcher kicked in as well. I just didn't feel like I had the answers that I needed. And I didn't think that the students really um, demonstrated or really understood what um, my perception and the literature review uh, guided me when, when talking about what is open readiness and what is open learning. And that's how we ended up doing learning pathway four. So another project. And then finally, phase three is all your data analysis, knowledge mobilization, and writing up your dissertation. Yes, I definitely totally transformed in the experience. And I think the number one thing was definitely becoming more humble and realizing that I'm a noob in many respects and many things. Um, it's a flexible design for emerging research. So I could change things as I went along and it blends both qualitative and quantitative, although this was much more qualitative. Um, and there's an evaluation of innovation for continual improvement. So it's always trying to get you to think about what you can do better, what you can improve on. And the way you do that is connecting with your participants. So the project. So how did I do this? I uh, worked on expanding open educational practices in a grade 10 classroom. The grade 10 classroom was at a program called Building Futures. And Building Futures is in Airdrie, Alberta. And I'm allowed to say all of this because they gave consent <laughs> to admit who was participating in the research. And th the Building Futures program is where they build a house while they are completing their grade 10 courses. So grade 10 is uh, 15 year old courses. And what's important about that is they were already displaying and there were already multiple elements of open learning connecting with community, but they weren't necessarily connecting in digital context. So that was my original focus. How can we develop digital literacies um, for the students and the teacher and, and what, what will happen in, in terms of will their learning environments expand? Will their learning experiences expand as a result of access to this digital um, learning and digital tools and opportunities? So the way we did that is there are four learning pathways as we discussed, learning pathway one, all of these link out to all the details. So I've kept all the information. So a lot of this People have asked me about like what were the resources for each one. So they're all linked in there and we can link that in on the webinar site afterwards. But the first learning pathway was how do I search and communicate online? So the students learned how to search online. They learned how to communicate online. They learned how to find credible content. And we focused on inquiry. Um, yeah, grade student, students in the 10th grade are 15 years old, 15 or 16. So the the interesting part about Learning Pathway 1 was the students were really excited to search online and learn about communicating online. The, their initial concern was, why are they doing all the work and why wasn't I doing the work? Using an inquiry-based pedagogical approach um, was fascinating in a 15-year-old environment because they wanted me to tell them what to do and how to do it. So that was their biggest struggle, not searching online and communicating online, but changing the, the way that we were doing pedagogy and using like a project-based um, uh, 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 pedagogical approach. So once we realized that the students had a few concerns, we changed the way that we were teaching a bit, changed um, the, the inquiry-based approach. So for learning pathway two, we focused on who is my online audience? Um, and that focused on data security, privacy, digital mapping, and data analysis. And if we're thinking about digital literacies in general, LP1 and LP2 kind of covered the main foundational um, components of what most K-12 curriculum, you well, they say that they offer, I guess you could say. So that, that's where they, they came from. So the 21st century learning competencies, this is what they're, they, they say they're doing. What intrigued me about this was we focus on who is my online audience and some of the gentlemen in my 
um, in that this project were fascinated with data analysis. They were very intrigued at how data could tell stories. And so then I started to see how, because we were always using open data in this case, in, in any of our, our, um, our explorations, they started to learn about what open data was and how to use it and how that connected to numeracy. And I, I was just blown away by the, the amount of other things going on within the research that I didn't necessarily think about. All I was trying to do was develop an understanding and awareness so they knew how to find these resources, how to think about privacy, how to think about data and security. So now that they had foundational knowledge um, and we made some changes and tweaks, our third learning pathway was how do I solve a community problem? So we used a design thinking approach, which used unlimited social media. They could connect to any network. They could connect to anyone and anything outside classroom walls. They could use open content. They could use closed content if they wanted. They had unlimited access to the world. And we had permission to do this through our district. We um, which was interesting. So we, we did not track their personal social media because that was never part of um, the research, but it's also unethical in, in, in many ways. But we did track, they designed and created their own groups in social media. So we were, and they were anonymous kind of groups. So we were able to track those. And some of the community problems that they solved were as basic as finding, um, in Canada, we have uh, skating rinks and uh, neighborhood skating rinks and because lots of our kids play hockey and the problem is the big kids take over the skating rinks all the time so they designed community skating rink online sign up sheets so that everybody would have an opportunity to skate at different times hi hi Marin. and um that was one example another example this is where i started to see students who had um, higher academic um, um, pass, we would say, or higher academic um, grades and assessment until they hit my class, I guess. And so they would look at any of these inquiry or design thinking projects and try to just fill in the blanks and complete the checklist. Ada, that's a really good question. We They mostly used Instagram, but they were allowed to use anything they wanted, but they were dependent upon Instagram, I would say. Um, so in this case, this student decided that he just wanted to take the whole class outside of the classroom and go for a hike and organize a hike with the class because technically it met the, how do you solve a community prog problem? He met all the check boxes. Let's put it that way. And in any classroom, he probably would have gotten a, because he did meet the requirements. But I remember having a conversation and looking at him and, and <laughs> knowing that he was a student who had the potential to do a little bit more. And, and I just had a disappointed look on my face, I guess. And I, and I talked to him and he's like, what, what is there, is there something wrong with that? And I said, no, there's nothing wrong with that. But, but what is really, what, what do you really want? He's like, well, I just really want to get out of here. I hate grade 10. I just want to, I want to leave this classroom. I want to get out of school. I want to go somewhere else. I'm like, well, why don't you do something about that? And so you could see, uh, and there's a part in my uh, dissertation which shows my observation of him as he looked frustrated and tried to figure out who is this teacher and who is this person who's trying to encourage him to, to, <laughs> to do something different, to expand outside of his walls, heaven forbid. And finally he did, he did take that risk and he connected with the, the uh, house builder who was helping us with this program. And he asked her what, what she would do. And she said, you know, I'd always love to go build a house in another country. And he's like, hmm. So he came back in the classroom and he was quiet. And then over the next week, he developed a whole new program where he invited all the fellow alumni, all the current students, all the former teachers and anyone um, in that immediate kind of community called Building Futures to go to Ecuador. And they went last summer and they built, uh, started to build a school because they took the skills that they had been learning in that program and then connected them to another country. And, and now he's developed a program where they're gonna be going annually to build schools in Ecuador. All because 
um, I just encourage him to go beyond the walls of his uh, regular formal network. Another story, though, is the ability for different students with different perspectives to connect and and build on what they wanted to do. I know all because I look disappointed at him, which just tells you what we could do if we just all look disappointed at people. Um, uh, to another student that I had ha happened to be transgendered, and at the beginning of the this project in particular, they all had the opportunity to pitch what they wanted to do. And in Alberta at the time, we had Gay Straight Alliance clubs. And she was really, or sorry, they were really upset because there was this animosity about these gay straight alliance clubs and 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 they didn't understand why there was such fear about these clubs and they wanted other people to understand the potential for these clubs and the importance of these clubs so they stood up in front of the class and they presented their idea and there was kind of the silence and then there was another girl who is very christian focused um and she came from a a, a homeschooling um environment before she came to this class and she said you know i want to work with you because i want to learn about your perspective because I don't understand it at all and what they did was using their digital literacies and skills they developed online surveys that they individually took to each of their communities so like a very Christian um, church-based community asking questions about gay straight alliances and alternatively um, they took it to their uh, um, uh, their gay straight alliance clubs and and some of their support groups and then they took the data and they compared and contrasted the data and they pulled it together and then they looked at at the same time they did a mini lit review on the history of gay um um specifically anyone who had treated anyone gay badly through time that was really really good. and why they were treated badly through time from a christian perspective and from a uh, more of a, a gay perspective i would say or queer perspective and then they compared and contrasted their notes they took it back to their communities and they talked about it and then they brought their whole presentation and they sent it to our provincial government to say this is what happens when you bring people together to have conversations. So those are a couple of examples, all the way from skating rinks to rethinking gay straight alliances to building schools in Ecuador. And um, many of them have continued after this project. But even when we did that, I think anyone who knows me, I have high expectations of myself and others, they did these in groups. They didn't do it by themselves, which was really interesting. And as an adult in open learning communities, it's you who has to be the open learner, you who has to take the risk, you who has to understand what it means to be an open learner, and you who connects and interacts with others and, and builds upon that, those sustainable relationships. So learning pathway four, was all about uh, storytelling and perspective. And what we did was um, we looked at what is storytelling um, and perspective from around the world. And we took it from a globalization perspective and we integrated media literacy and we promoted critical thinking and remixing. And we asked the students to, they needed to tell a story about themselves, tell it, and they did it in a digital context. And we were going to share them all. But we also brought in um, elders and we decided to look at, an, an, at everything from an indigenous um, worldview. And we asked the elders to come in so that we could see everything from a different perspective because in my class, we tend to be very colonial and settler based. So if we started a project from a different perspective and started to look at how do you find out about a different perspective, how would that change what our final story would look like? And would that help students start to share and build um, trust and start to share openly? Um, So these are the open intervention by stages. This tells you exactly what we focused on for each one, how we expanded into the learning spaces, how the student demonstrated their identity outside the classroom and all the digital artifacts that they used. The primary source of data collection were participant reflections. So you can see some of those reflections. And the other thing we used were visitor and resident maps that I think a lot of you have learned about in different 
context, and that describes really where people perceive their learning in digital spaces and what they're learning with. So for example, a visitor is someone who just goes but doesn't leave a presence in that they don't leave like a footprint, for example, all knowing that everyone leaves data footprints everywhere we go. But this is if we're not envisioning it from the data point of view. So if you go and you search Google, for example, you're being a visitor. But if you stay on Twitter and it's somewhere that you've created a reputation and you've stayed a long place or, or a long time and you can go back to is sustainable, then it then you are a resident. And then you think about it in terms of personal, like do you do this in your personal learning or do you do it as a result of your institutional learning? So this is an example from an adult in um, a virtual a via a visitor and resident map. So he spends a lot of time in Google Docs, for example, in his personal life and in his institutional life, as well as Twitter and his blogging, which is interesting, it's more institutional, but he's there a lot. Generally, we kind of understand here. This is what the students provided. So you see here that everyone spends a lot of time in Google. There you go. But they spend their time in Instagram. Thank you, Martin. Yeah. Um, they also spend time in Snapchat and Netflix and YouTube. And when we use these throughout the, the study, and what we learned was by the end, the, the students in K-12 or in high school learning environments we're adamant that they don't just learn in digital spaces, they learn in face-to-face -face spaces as well. So even though I might have encouraged them to focus on digital spaces, you'll see from the beginning, they put in all the other places that they learn and uh, like marketing, acting, tutoring, church, groceries. Um, this, 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 the whole project took place from October to the end of February. Um, I, we didn't see huge changes with the use of visitor and resident maps, but what it did do was encourage the students to realize that you don't just learn in formal learning environments, you learn in informal learning environments. It also really helps with the instructional design and changing of our of what we were doing because it helped us think about spaces in which they're currently learning and think about how we could integrate some of their passion and personal interests into our design. And yes, when I talked to um, David White, and I did connect with him about this. He's like, we didn't use, we didn't think about it this way. We didn't, this is, he was really excited because he didn't think of it that, this way at all. And when I've talked to Dominic Orr about this, for example, and he was working with um, some refugees, he talked about the importance here of seeing prior learning and what they've done or, or different ways in which to learn and where people are learning. And that really helps him in terms of supporting all learners. So there's all sorts of things that came up that we didn't necessarily think of because it's usually used in a library context where you're just looking at the spaces, the digital spaces in which uh, students are learning. Um, this is the data collection tracking sheet to give you an idea of how much data is collected with design-based research. The data analysis, uh, a lot of the data analysis started by doing webinars and doing presentations with my participants and colleagues and then it was able to, I was able to help shape the themes that had come out of the data and compare and contrast with what I have to what they were saying. Um, so we started looking at the similar codes and themes between the learning pathways. And then once I had all the, the codes and themes and I could create my basic findings, what I did was I compared and contrasted my findings to the open pedagogy attributes, Hegarty's open pedagogy attributes. So I compared the research findings, the research project findings, and then looked at how they were different. So the research extensions, what it, what came about in high school learning context that I didn't necessarily see in the open pedagogy attributes. It expanded upon the literature as well. And that's how I created um, three separate areas of specifically answering the questions. So my research question one, which asked, what are the students and teachers' perspectives of open learning experiences? You can look at them now, but those are the open learner awareness. Um, research question two was, to what extent um, does OEP expand learning opportunities? So this talks about how open educational practices expands learning opportunities. And three was a combination of one and two 
um, the essential conditions of open learning. What do we need to do um, in order to, to ensure that open learning can happen? <laughs> because it won't always happen if teachers aren't intentional um, in what they're thinking about. We can look at this more in a bit. Um, so this then led into my final framework, which is the Open Learning Design Intervention version two. And there, this talks about um, stage one is now building relationships. Um, it's not just about student, you have to do something and that's building relationships. And these continue through the whole process. So this is how, how do we, how do we, how do we do open educational practices? Like, what do we do? So the first thing is we build relationships. The second thing is we co-design learning pathways. The third is building and sharing knowledge. The fourth is um, supporting building personal learning networks. And the whole way through, we reflect, reflect, reflect. And while we're like, remember that it's not just the students doing this, the teachers are doing this at the same time. These are some examples of how do you build relationships and what the students said about safe learning spaces. Things like failure to take, uh, failure and risk taking is encouraged and recognized and does not jeopardize others' learning. I'm just going to finish up. We we blog openly, so we show how we sh we show what we're doing in order to build relationships with others in the community. When you look at co-designing learning pathways, there's specific things that we can identify, like personal learning context, epistemological choice, the students needed to know how they were learning. Um, throughout the process, I encouraged the students to give me feedback. So this was the open learning cycle that I kept asking them about. So they were using those words throughout and the one, two, three, four, five, six, that was because it was a digital or a Google doc and they gave me feedback to, to tell me whether this was what they were doing or not and how they were doing it and whether they agreed or not. Um, this is where higher ed came in because higher ed talks about a lot about surface learning and deep learning. And when the students struggled with the idea that they actually couldn't just get a 65 in an open learning context, it, it really didn't, it, 65 didn't exist. So the whole idea of assessment is another dissertation. So we created this triangle together to talk about what they need to do in order to feel successful in open learning environments. We created rubrics which we have links to, to discuss levels of openness and levels of open readiness. And then the next one is building and sharing knowledge. How do they do this? So how do they demonstrate clear and transparent evidence of learning? How do they expand um, who they are and who they want to share as? The learning process, feedback loops. I know I'm skimming through this, but this you everyone can go through this in more detail. These are uh, note that deep and surface learning is actually Biggs and Kuhn. Um, so this shows how the students were very dependent on each other's at the beginning, and then it showed specifically where they went to next in terms of who they wanted to share with. So who, how, what are those like steps that students take or learners take when they are becoming an open learner? And this shows you how. So this is who they connect with on the bottom. And what's fascinating is it focuses, it kind of went down into the land. And I know I talked to Martin about this last year at OER 19 about how as the students were offered more and more opportunities out into the cloud and to do anything, they kept coming closer and closer and closer back to family, local community and the land, which is really interesting um, and explore more. And then we use Trello boards and, um, and project management tools instead of blogs to help the students understand. And this also created a space so that we could get feedback. And this is so these are the principles of open learning design in any learning context. And this is kind of where I'm going to end it for questions because everything else is data. So you can read those. And then um, I know I gave you too much information. So now we can ask questions. <laughs> Thank you, Verena. Um, I feel like every one of those slides was probably a talk in itself. There's so much in <laughs> 
<laughs> and it's fascinating. So thank you very much. And I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't mean to rush you, just I knew there was there. No, people, thank you for doing that. I thought people would probably have questions. And so I wanted to make sure we had time for that. So no, no. Yeah. Um, I'm going to open up to people for questions. And I can give you the mic if anyone wants to ask it like uh, verbally, or you can just ask it in the chat box. So I'll, I'll um, leave it for, for a couple of seconds to ask people questions. And then if not, I've got some stuff. Just while people are coming up with questions, um, it's, it's not the most important thing of your research, but your diagrams are actually really good. And I think just a kind of small point that I, often, uh, I mentioned in the chat, I often tell my students like, give me a diagram that almost sums up all your research that you can talk to it. And lots of people really struggle with that. And I think it's a super useful thing for your readers and your examiners, you know, just having those sort of those conceptual methodological diagrams that kind of put everything together and explain how all the stuff you're doing comes together. So, so you you know that one you showed earlier on, I think was a really good example of that. And I think just having that kind of thing to share um, um, through the GoGen network is actually really useful. So thank you. For that. Right. So let's go back to the other question. So Helen asks, um, how did you manage the iteration of the design research with the requirements from REB? Does that make sense? So the, the ethics, she's asking about ethics. Yeah, yeah. So um, their, their biggest concern wasn't my online surveys or the reflections. So because I emphasize reflections, the way I did reflections was really gave me that flexibility. Um, I did ask them though, like some online surveys, but I asked them to reflect in the online survey. So, you know, I played a bit with that as well, to be honest, Helen. But but the biggest concern from the ethical REB was what is the impact on these learners? Like if this doesn't work, the, the ethics review board was very concerned about the whole concept of me doing a different pedagogical approach or encouraging it. They were really worried. And, and the reason they, they, I actually had to get a letter from the teacher who said, I want to do this. I can't do this without Verena. So therefore, ethically, you're preventing me from doing what I want. Like the ethics board felt that I was going to hurt the students, in their opinion. Um, but the teacher helped me out. So that was the ethic. That's how I got through ethics. I, it was due to the methodological approach, a collaborative methodological approach, and having those relationships with people. So um, Jennifer one. asks, um, yeah, help. I can't read them all. Could you talk a bit more about the teacher's role in this? For example, did they need to learn new skills, pedagogies, etc., in order to support and enhance the open learning design? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, so while the teacher was very flexible and open and already doing an amazing program, um, he had to develop skills in digital literacies, and he was really, really into that. Um, however, I remember I kept asking him, have you felt that moment where open maybe changed your world or rocked your world we often talk about that in the community and, and for me it was like being in a webinar and somebody answering my question out of 300 other people in the in the box i'm like wow they see me as someone within the big world right like i'm important too and he's like no i haven't had that happen i haven't had that happen um he he didn't entirely engage and what was really interesting was the students engaged and many of them, in terms of open readiness and open learning, were ahead of the teacher in many of the skills and competencies that I mentioned in the rubric by the end, because he he just didn't he didn't take those risks and he didn't go there. He just kind of followed my lead in many ways. It's something I would definitely think about how I would do differently in the future. Uh, sorry, I missed Marion's um, question, which was: Do you do you give practical recommendations for teachers, institutes, and or learners? Um, th well, what actually what's happened is two weeks ago, I was up in Alaska and I was speaking at a university and I used this slide and we actually used the principles to guide an, an instructor's new class that she was designing and how she could um, integrate open educational practices. So if I would say practical advice is I'd use these principles and I'd use the rubric also that I created that I didn't go into in a lot of detail here um, because 
new to open learning, they really liked the slow kind of checklist approach and doing one thing at a time. But the principles, um, one of the faculty pointed out up in Alaska, they're like, these are, these are pedagogical principles for everything. And they're really good, but you don't have to put open. <laughs> but it was really interesting that open got me here. So they, that's why they like them because it was um, a, a kind of a, a common rhetoric, common use of language, wasn't too crazy, not too out of left field. It was just really focused on good learning and good practice. So maybe that's what I'd say was the most practical recommendation. So if you have any other questions, anybody put them in the box. I'll ask one. Uh, Verena, just um, I can't remember when we first met you through GoGN, um, but I, I know you sort of were trying to bring together lots of different things. I think, and I, I wondered if there was a, a point in your research where you felt something made it all come together. Um, so I've got two questions. I think well, was there that kind of point where all these bits slotted into place, and 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 how did that work for you? But also, I guess on a kind of more GoGN point. What did you find most useful from um, uh, getting out of the network? The, the moments it came all together were like going to the webinars and hearing about everyone's struggles and then realizing that struggle is a normal part of your dissertation <laughs> because the concepts behind open learning I didn't have anyone in my supervisory committee in particular, although I had Dr. Porter, to be fair, but in my immediate supervisory team at my university, they didn't really know what open learning was. And I know that many of us in the GoGN community have that concern or problem as well. So I often felt like I was imagining things or seeing things that weren't necessarily there. And then I would go off and meet, you know, Catherine Cronin. The No, actually, when I say that, the moment it all came together was when I presented with GoGN and I was presenting to people in my literature review. That has like, I think that did it, that I could actually network with them and talk to them and know that I wasn't making stuff up. <laughs> and they, and when Rory McGreal was like asking me specific questions or Catherine's like, oh yeah, I can see how that could work. Like that pulled it all together. And in, in terms of like Gojian, the, the same, like having conversations with Leo Havman, all of you should have conversations with Leo Havman, but that will stop him from finishing his dissertation. But at the same time, having those close relationships with people within the community. And so you can go to that higher level and you don't have to explain all this stuff. Like even today, we didn't get to the end. And most of you understand the end stuff because I'm always explaining how we got there. And I'm always explaining what OER is. And I'm always explaining what open pedagogy is. <laughs> so maybe that's it, having that. I, I agree. Um, I'm, I'm Leo's supervisor, so <laughs> do have conversations with him, but don't don't get in the way of him doing his pitch. <laughs> <laughs> but, no, he's great. but I think it is, so I think like, um, people often sort of form little, so I know in, when we've done other seminars we go to and people have sort of formed sub whatsapp groups wherever around particular methodologies or particular kind of conceptual frameworks and it's making those connections that i think that are really uh here's another nice diagram yeah that's my whole dissertation so i agree with you martin that you have to be able to draw it like i could have done my whole presentation on this slide because it talks about everything but yeah. then i have you have to scaffold it too right so. absolutely cool it, the the network, yeah, yeah, Carolyn, it's being exposed to the people in the network. Like, I remember when you did your webinar. I remember when Bea was asking you questions. And she's like, do you think this is too big? Like, do you think, how are you going to focus this? Like, I, rem I remember being there. And I might not have contributed because I was being a lurker and I didn't know what was going on. But I was learning by being a part of this community. And I people at my university are very jealous that we have these connections around the world. I don't know. It is. Yeah, 
Caroline's webinar was very helpful. And from a conceptual framework point of view, Penny's webinar was very helpful. <laughs> Jennifer's true. Draw, draw. <laughs> draw. We, we, we need to rename it the art Goji and networks. So, well, but, you know, Chrissy does it so well. I can't. I'm not artistic, but I certainly learned that, uh, like you're saying, Martin, visualizing things helps other people understand, and it ensures that you know what you're talking about. Yeah, that's right. I think it just helps you as much as I think I've been able to put it into that form. Yeah. Cool. Uh, are there any other questions for Verena? Otherwise, I'll stop the uh, recording and we can close off then. So I just want to say thank you again, Verena. That was really interesting, and there's so much in there. So I'm, I'm sure it'd be lots of things for people to go back and watch again and, and get the most from it, as I say, and your thesis is uh, up on the GoGN site where amongst the others as well, so people can dig into that as well.